Let's get it. What's up guys? Welcome back to another episode of Stronger TV. We got another whiteboard session going today. Um, and we're talking about program design variables. Okay, so something that we talk about is a big crossover between our two fields is, is when people are having issues, whether it's uh, strength development or it's injury prevention, um, a lot of times there's a way that we can manipulate these sorts of variables to keep them training, to get them back on the right track without necessarily having to pull things away from them. Right? You got it, yeah. So I think from your end, Dan, the biggest things, and this is the first thing you talk about with people, is how we adjust volume and intensity. Yeah. Right? Because what we see, especially with a CrossFit crowd or a powerlifting crowd or strongman or whatever it is we're working with is people go super, super hard. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and it's pretty normal to get banged up when you do that. Yeah. Right? So sometimes these people come in, they're super banged up, they're like, oh, I can't train, I can't do any of this. What they don't realize is that if we just do a little bit to kind of manipulate these variables that they can keep training and we can push back to that. Right? Got it. Yeah. So why do you think that is, Dan? Well, I think the biggest thing is that, like, what's, what's important for people to understand, I think, as long as that person coming into you has a really good program. So if I know Kiefer is, like, writing programming for someone who comes in for, like, a power of the meet or something like that, I know that it's going to be a really solid program. Um, there's going to be some thought that goes into goals, peaking, periodization, all that stuff, right? So part of it is that I want to change the program up as little as possible. So I just want to reiterate how important what Kiefer is saying is that we can continue training, but we probably have to manipulate a few variables. But the more we can keep the program the same without hurting the person further and getting them better, right, in the process, then that's, that's the money right there. Um, as far as the volume and the intensity, right, I think a lot of times, you know, athletes don't even have pain until they get closer to their maximal loads, right? So decreasing that weight a little bit a lot of times will help someone get out of pain pretty easily, sure. right? Uh, the other piece is that volume is a huge player. So some people can can definitely squat, let's say, once or twice a week, but as soon as they add in that third day, they start to get beat up, right? So if we're concerned that it's a bit of an overuse issue, a very easy thing to do is to start to pull a little bit of the volume out. And that's either sets, maybe that's reps, that's also days during the week. Um, and a lot of times that gets them feeling better and better pretty quickly. So Sure. Yeah. I, I think it's important for people to realize that there's a big difference between <laughs> what's optimal for performance and what might be optimal for health. Right? Yeah. And oftentimes if we're really looking to push performance to a higher level, that we're gonna push past what might be like a normal healthy threshold because we're trying to get those extra responses. Right? So it's normal to get banged up. Yeah. And it's not that you know what you're doing is wrong, it's just we're pushing the limits a little bit and we gotta pull back a little. Yeah. Like we talk about this with our baseball guys all the time, like throwing 120 pitches is not optimal for your health, but it might be for a performance on that day. You got so it. it's not yeah. that you're gonna stop throwing, but maybe your next couple sessions in, you throw a little lighter, you throw a little less hard, you don't go as far on long toss and stuff, and then we build back to those points. Yeah. Which I think is why it's so important, we've talked about this a million times, is to build a, a giant base and a foundation of work capacity so that you can actually start to tolerate these sorts of volumes and intensities over time. Yeah. But if you don't take it as a gradual approach, whether you're coming back from injury or you're just trying to build up, that it's a lot of times you end up spinning your wheels. Yeah, for sure. I think a good example is kind of when I first started working with you, Kiefer. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of that like really high intensity mentality. Um, I, I've done a ton of West Side stuff, a lot of max effort stuff in the past. I've been a big fan of guys like Wendler, right? Five through one program, which is you're basically building up to one big set for sure. the day. And kind of the whole idea behind the training is like, if you hit that max effort set, you can like pretty much go home, you know? Like the rest of the accessory stuff is not quite as important. So uh, that worked well for me for a long period of time. When I started working with you, we were starting to build that volume up, you know? Yeah. And that's tough. I'm, I'm not used to doing more than one set of heavier deadlifts. So for me, building that up felt like a lot. But the other piece is like, I've been able to hit some, some big PRs. I'm doing some stuff I've never been able to do in the past. I think a lot of that is because I've been able to build up that volume and, and be able to tolerate it, right? Yeah. But it's not like we jumped in right away and they're like, Dan, I want you to do five sets of deadlifts at like, you know, 85, 90% of your max. I wasn't doing that at all. It was a bit of a slow buildup. Um, and then the other piece is that I do deal with problems from time to time. Like my hip's a real good example. So um, when my hip is not feeling great, a lot of times the first thing I do is I just drop the volume. You know, I just sure. take one day of squatting out per week. Over the next few weeks, my hip starts feeling better and better. All right, feeling pretty good. Let's inject that other day again. And that works really well, so. Well, I think what you do a better job of than other people that we could give as a suggestion to everyone out there is that you track everything on a daily and weekly basis, right? Yeah. So you track how you're feeling going into the gym, you track how you're feeling coming out of the gym. And so when we push the limits or we add, you know, another three sets total of squatting in a week, week to week, if you see that your, you know, your health or how you're feeling or your readiness is starting to decline, yeah. you see exactly where that's coming from. Yeah. So we know either, okay, let's pull back a little bit this week or let's just not push forward again next week. So we start to find that line so we can feather on that versus pushing it too, too far. Yeah. And that way you're always able to work at what your threshold is, slowly start to bump it up 
up. Yep. But had we not done that, you might have stuck with you know just working up to one heavy set forever and never knowing that you could build a bigger base. Yeah, that's really big. It's one of the things that we're trying to really promote right now in our program, Stronger, is that we're trying to get athletes to kind of like auto-regulate, right? Sure. So one of the questions I started asking the group is like towards the end, like, oh, how's everyone feeling? Because generally with our program, we kind of ramp things up in volume and also intensity, so it gets a little harder towards the end of the month. And uh, we want to make sure athletes are just not going bananas the entire sure. month. So they know that the beginning of the month is a bit of a time to start building up. And at the end, you are really pushing and you're feeling a little run down. It's kind of expected, right? And then we ask a lot of questions at the beginning of the month, say, how are you feeling? How are things going? And just let athletes know, like, these first two weeks are not there so you can go crazy again, right? We're actually sure. taking it down a notch so that you're able to tolerate that week three, week four again, and then we break it down again. So yeah. I think and, that's super important. And it's tough because so many people out there, just like people in Stronger, they're following a templated program. Right? Yep. So if the template says, all right, we're going to work up to this much volume, well, if that much volume is too much for you, then you're kind of SOL, I know, right? Yeah. You don't know what to do with it. So we talk to them a lot about <coughs> each week when you jump up in volume, start to take, take note of how you're feeling with that. Yeah. And so, you know, Johnny and Jane might stop at the volume for week two, yeah. but Sarah and Steve might feel really good and they push to week three volume. And so yeah. that way, everybody's able to kind of individualize where they're at, mm -hmm. still within the same program. You got it. So um, one of the things I want to talk to you about, because we were just chatting about it yesterday, so we just talked about... All of these things are things that we can try to uh, moderate some more, and we should probably get to these and talk specifically yeah. about that. But now that we're on this topic of auto-regulation, let's say um, that we want to try to modify some stuff, right, that you're not feeling great. What are the things that you have in your training journal that you write down, you're like, oh, I don't feel good, or like, I'm, I don't feel ready today. How do, you actually, how do you actually determine that for the training day to feel like you actually should modify? Sure. Know? Well, yeah. I would say, you know, as far as what you're tracking, right, a simple readiness on a scale of one to three or one to five works great, yeah. right? Taking note of how much you slept the night before also works great for people. But then what I usually suggest is go through your warm-up as normal, right? Go through your normal warm-up sets of your main lift as normal, and you just might get to that second to last warm-up or that last warm-up and be like, you know what, this is all I got today. Yeah. And either, you know, you just modify the intensity, which is why we use RPE a lot of times, so people can still get the same training in, or maybe you just cut back the volume. Yeah. So maybe you work up to the top set, you cut out the volume after, and you move on and live to train another day. Yeah. And it can be as simple as that, right? But I think too many people will just totally bag the whole day if they're not feeling good. Yeah. You got it. The other thing I think that you've taught me a lot, too, is that let's say that you have a high volume week, right? And you know that the, the intensity is not that important, but you don't feel great. So maybe we just cut off one set right because yeah. now we're altering the volume just slightly right um, let's say that you have the following week is supposed to be more intensity based right and you want to i'm sorry i kind of said that backwards so let's say that um the volume is really important on week three sure and you know you need to hit that volume because that's like the the reason why you're there maybe you shave down the intensity a little bit and still hit all that volume because you're not feeling great but you're trying to still get the training effect of a high volume week right totally. let's say the following week is an intensity week you're supposed to hit something that's really heavy but you're not feeling great right so you probably still want to try to hit that intensity that day but maybe you take a set off on that week just because we know that the importance of volume is not as big on that week so you can keep that training as close as possible to what's actually written on the piece sure. of paper yeah, yeah it's important to have a good coach client relationship right and be able to, to relay the message of what the goal of the block is so that people can set realistic expectations so this is an ongoing conversation we have with people all the time yeah i like it man do so you want to talk right. about some of these other guys yeah let's move on to this other stuff right so we kind of beat the hell out of these two topics but the rest of these guys are all variables that i play with a ton with exercise variation right mm -hmm. so we play with Tempo. So this is stuff like slowing down an eccentric, adding a pause, intentionally slowing down a concentric portion of the lift. Yeah. Range of motion. This is a lot more in your world too. Is you know sometimes we modify range of motion because somebody has pain, mm -hmm. or sometimes we modify range of motion so that we can focus on a specific weak point or something. Yeah. Right? Stance and grip. So squat, bench. This is huge. Is going wider or narrower, right? Going wider or narrower with your grip on everything. And then yeah. implement is the last one. I know you play with this a ton. Is changing up bars. So going from a regular barbell to a safety squat bar. Right, going to maybe a goblet squat or something else that changes that. Oh, so much good so stuff. So let's kind of go through these each a little <laughs> bit without beating the crap out of them All and right. uh, talk about how we use them. All so right, good. First one is tempo. I know you use these a lot. I use them a lot as a teaching tool for people. Right, so I'll like slow it. down eccentrics so I can teach people to build control, especially if I'm teaching them a new position. Right, we'll add pauses to the bottom of a squat or the bottom of a bench to build more strength there in the spot that we traditionally don't spend as much time in. And I've actually started a lot more recently is slowing down the tempo on the concentric portion of the lift. Yeah. Which I've found builds a ton of time under tension, helps people get strong, and it teaches them to grind through a lift in the spots where usually we would see, you know, in a squat, maybe somebody's hips start to shoot back. Or in a bench, we see elbows flare really early. Yeah. So by going lighter, 
but then slowing down the concentric and forcing them to drive through a position they don't want to be in, it teaches them a ton that carries over into their heavy lifts and how they're able to grind through stuff. Love it, man. That's all really good stuff. I recently put uh, tempo split squats into the program. Yeah. And everyone was complaining about them. They're just so freaking hard. Uh, I was doing a front foot, rear foot tempo, three up, three down, no pauses, right? I think I got to like the 50s or 60s on the on the uh, the split squat for sets eight, and it was like it was like hell. It was probably one of the yeah. worst things that we've done. You know, uh, one of the reasons why I really like tempo stuff is for people with pain, right? And let's let's think about that split squat for uh, the split squat as an example, right? Let's say you have an athlete that's just prone to some knee pain, right? So one of the things that we like to do is inject this tempo work kind of early on in the beginning stages of your uh, uh, periodization. Let's say you're trying to squat more weight. So early on in your uh, periodization, maybe you have some tempo stuff in the beginning. And one of the reasons why this is really nice is that um, we tend to beat up our joints a lot as athletes. Like we're always trying to lift heavy weights because of that sometimes things get beat up. Um, so one of the things we can do is we can just slow down the speed that you perform um, the exercise, and that's phenomenal because you still get the muscles working a lot. There's so much time under tension, you get a lot of soreness, there's a lot going on within the muscle, but since the loads are not that heavy and the speed is much slower, the stress on the joint is down quite a bit, right? So if we know that most people really get beat up towards the end of that periodization, right, when you're, when you're peaking, what we can do is we can say, all right, let's make sure that we don't overuse the joints early on, and then we'll, we'll pretty much beat on those things when we get towards the very end of the periodization so you can actually peak and, and do well. You know? yeah. A lot of times what I do for athletes, let's say that you have the same example. Someone's having knee pain and today you're supposed to do lunges, right? So maybe we modify to a split squat, right? So there's a little less movement in a split squat as compared to like a reverse lunge and we just slow it down. Right? Because if you're just going slower with the motion, again, you're not using the same load, it's not the same stress to that joint and you get a lot of work done. Right? So it's a phenomenal way to still train despite having some pain on that day. Yeah. yeah. All right. Second Boom. one. Range of motion. ROM. Okay. Right, so we use this kind of two ways. We were talking about with the split squats. In some cases, we use it to extend our range of motion to make it longer, right? Yeah. So that we can get uh, deeper joint angles, right? So we can train the muscles a little mm -hmm. harder and we get more time under tension because of the increased range of motion. Yeah. But what we use even more for, and I think you know, people are more commonly used to this, is, is for shortening ranges of motion. So what I do a lot of times in training is, is I'll restrict range of motion on something like a bench press by using pins or boards or going to a floor press, right? And I'll use that because it gives me an opportunity to train the bench an additional day in the week in a slightly less stressful manner, right? So like we it. talk about like it, it'll train the top half of your lift, it'll train lockout, it trains shoulders and triceps a little bit more. But what I see even more so is it's the easiest way for me to be able to add in maybe a third benching session in the week without totally crushing somebody early on. Yeah. You know? I love it. I mean, there's, there's so many things we could probably talk about with this. I think that shortening the range of motion is kind of a double-edged sword and can be extremely beneficial and it really depends on what someone's dealing with, right? So I'll use like back pain as an example. Um, some individuals when they have back pain, they don't tolerate a lot of rounding, right? I'm not saying rounding is necessarily bad for you, but some individuals have low back pain, it just feels horrible to round, but if they stay neutral when they're doing an exercise, they feel pretty good, right? Yep. So if you think about a squat, everyone does get a little bit of rounding at the bottom position of a squat. It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? So having this flexion is naturally going to happen as you run out of range of motion in the ankle and the hip. They call it butt wink. Everyone has at least a little bit of this, right? But if your back is really irritated, it may not like this whatsoever, but it can still probably tolerate some loading. So what ends up happening is you can cut that range of motion, all of a sudden you don't get as much butt wink and you can still train for that day. Uh, the one thing I will say is that sometimes when you shorten that range of motion, you have to use more load in order to get a training effect. Sure. So if you have that same sore back that's not really tolerating a lot of load, then it just might not be the best variation for that athlete, you know? Yeah. Uh, but there's a ton of wiggle room in what you can do as far as altering the range of motion and then maybe adding a tempo on top of that or changing the volume or changing the intensity. Um, you can manipulate all these variables so that athlete can actually train pretty well that day. Right. You know? And I think the cool thing, especially with stuff, you know, you talk about squat and we do this with deadlifts too, is range of motion can change over time, right? So if somebody is struggling to get into a good position in, in deeper ranges, well, we're going to start them restricted and then we'll slowly start chipping away and working back down to that over time. But you're, yeah. you're getting measurable progress week to week for that. Yeah. You know, and then like, like you it. talked about, you know, for something like a deadlift, um, maybe not as much for a squat. We don't do this a time, but with a deadlift, we might intentionally restrict range of motion because we want to overload. So yeah. I know that if I go elevated in a sumo deadlift that I can pull a little bit more than I could otherwise. So you start to get somebody used to having that load in their hands, right? Yeah. You build up a little bit of tolerance while maybe you're working on technique for the full range of motion and then you put the two together at the end. I like that, man. It's good. All right. Stance and grip. So an example that I would use for this is say, um, 
somebody is a pretty wide stance squatter, right? They squat really wide, they shoot their hips back a little bit more, it's a little more hip and back dominant for their squat. Well, we might go through periods of time in training where we intentionally go a little bit narrower in their stance, maybe even change bar position and put it higher on their back, and we force them to do a more upright squat. Mm -hmm. So we do this, we manipulate the angles, we manipulate the leverages a little bit so that I can focus on training their legs a little bit more, take a little bit of stress off their back, and we start to work on a variation that teaches them to be able to push through the ground versus being so reliant on that hip back position. Yeah. So I think kind of like we talked about with some of these other things, it's, it's also a way to kind of take a little stress away or you take away from stress from one region, add it to another region you so that we it. can continue to push training volume, right? So we can get more out of it without having it be so intense on certain areas of the body. Love that, man. I think that's a really great thing um, for a variety of reasons. So for one, if someone has, let's say, some low back pain or they have some hip pain, then just altering that stance a lot of times is enough to get rid of it, which is great, right? Or they allows them to train with minimal pain, so over the course of time they can get better. Um, the other thing I really like about altering this stance throughout the course of the year is exactly the same reasons Kiefer said from a performance perspective. Let's use myself for example. Let's say my hip just doesn't tolerate as much wide stance, really hips back type squatting. So I can only do that so much before my hip starts to bug me. I might do a lot of variations um, of squatting and kind of my off-season preparation stuff to mm -hmm. build that volume, build the preparation capacity, wherever it is, and then I may hammer some of the uh, very specific wide stance lifts right before I'm trying to peak for you know a new PR or something along those lines. But I don't end up hurting myself in the process and feel pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, similarly for myself recently, you know, I've been squatting three days a week. I'm deadlifting twice in the week, and I was sumo deadlifting twice in the week. But what I found is I started to get a little bit of hip irritation. So all I did was change my stance on one day, and I went to a conventional, and everything cleaned up. Yeah. Right? So I'm still able to train my deadlift, right? I get stronger in my hamstrings, I get stronger in my back, I do all of these things, but it just took a little bit of that specificity away that cleaned up my hip pain so I can keep training hard and prioritize that main lift day for me. Yeah, for sure. Like it. All right. Cool. Last one we'll go over real quick is implement, mm -hmm. right? So this is getting like more and more popular recently with specialty bars and whatnot, but um, changing implement can have a huge impact on what your leverages are and as well as where you put the stress on things. So I know yeah. you play a lot with safety squat bars, right? So I think the, the big thing that we originally started using the safety squat bar for was taking stress away from shoulder and elbow. Yeah. Right? So if you don't have to grip in this back squat position or you don't have good mobility for it, sweet, we can put your hands right out in front, you got comfy pads and you can go into your squat. Got but it. what we yeah. found doing this more and more is that it's actually a little bit of a different squat pattern. It yeah. changes the leverage, puts the weight out in front of you a little bit, and it allows you to have a different squat pattern, which takes a little bit of stress off your hip from what it sounds like for me. Yeah, I, I love changing the implement. I do this so much. Like this is, I, I really think that one principle we talked about in the beginning is so important. We want to try to change the training as little as possible, right? As long as the person has a really good training program. That's a big caveat. Some people have horrendous training programs, and it's probably the reason why they keep getting hurt in the future, right? But if there's a good training program, or there's a big need, or something coming up where they're really preparing well for it, and they're doing a good job of it, I don't want to change things up very much, right? But if you have some, let's say they have an irritated shoulder, and bench press is really bothering you, if you try a dumbbell, a lot of times that just takes away the pain, right? Yep. It's, it's phenomenal. Same thing with the squat. So if I'm squatting, right, and I'm using, let's say, a back squat, and I switch to a safety squat bar, and I tell athletes to stay a little more upright, a lot of times I can take away low back pain, hip pain. It can be phenomenal from that perspective. And then again, throughout the course of the training year, we can use all different implements so we can take advantage of working uh, the body in a way that it generally likes a little bit more. Sure. You know? I, th I think the last thing, just to kind of summarize this, is you know this back and forth has been nice for us because you're more on the injury prevention side. I'm a little bit more on the performance side. It's is real that good. all of these variables are not just to restrict somebody. They're not just for somebody that's hurt and can't train hard. These are things that we strategically implement throughout a year to work on technique to help accumulate more volume and to keep people healthy and and keep them interested in their training. Yeah, right. It's all related too, man. That's right. Yep. It's good. That's why right, it's so man. great where we're in there. <laughs> Love just hanging out with you, Kiefer. All right, I think that's all we got for today. Thank you guys for listening. Again, if you have any questions for us or topics you want us to go over in the future, make sure you shoot us a message and keep listening. Thank you.